<laughs> the colonel seeds the clouds with snowflakes or whatever it is he does up there. But anyway, so tonight I got a real good one for you, I hope. We're going to cover a lot of ground heading to the Americas. And for me, this is the really fun part of world history because for hundreds and thousands of years, everything happens in like Africa, Asia, and Europe. And what are the Americas doing this whole time? Well, Americas are kind of put into a tight, tough spot. And um, the reason why um, is just simple um, geography. So uh, I got to get a guy to get rid of the mine kingdoms there. Um, the original inhabitants of the Americas are going to come out of Asia and they're going to cross the good old Bering Strait into the Americas, following herds of game, deer, antelope, woolly mammoth, whatever. And what's really interesting about this, looking at human migration about three years ago, National Geographic found it's like, like some blonde-haired, blue-eyed mummies frozen in northern Mongolia. So we know this trek across you know, Africa into Asia over to the Americas is taking um, a long time. And so they get over here to the Americas, Canada, um, Alaska, and they start to migrate southward. And then the Ice Age ends. And as they were following the Bering Strait, my good old world history joke of the night, how do they get across the Bering Strait? Well, they took out their compass, they got their bearings, <laughs> and they <it's true. laughs> All right. Uh, that's lame. But anyway. Excuse me. <clears throat> wow. As the ice melts and the Bering Strait is gone, the people in the Americas are now cut off. They do not have access to worldwide cultural diffusion, so they're stuck. They will do many of the same things as cultures in Africa, Asia, and Europe. They're just going to be about 5,000 years behind. So they've got a lot of ground to make up because they don't have the Silk Road trade route. They don't have the Indian Ocean. They don't even have the ancient Phoenicians sailing around the Mediterranean spreading knowledge and culture. They've got to do everything from scratch. They'll do it. It just takes a long time. So as we come out of East Africa and migrate over, we go up and around. And so from here, going north to south, <coughs> um, unlike the other river valley civilizations we'll talk about in a minute, the Americas are completely different. Where you know, Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and China were localized in their river valley civilizations. They formed civilization, and the Americas are still migrating. And you look at, like, coming over the Cascade Mountains, going down the Pacific Coast, crossing over the Rockies to the Great Plains, to the deserts of the American Southwest, each geographic region is, is different. So people are moving, and they're still learning how to adapt, let alone getting down into the jungles of, you know, Central and South America. So everyone over here is established, and people of the Americas are still moving on. And as a result, there's not a whole lot of cultural interaction. Everybody is just kind of doing their, their same thing. And so these I find interesting, kind of the same drawings in the American Southwest, like out in Utah and Arizona, are found over in what is today Mongolia. And if you look at some of the Navajo language, and the way the Navajo built their houses, they're very similar to what you would find in Mongolia. And if you draw a parallel line, an east-west line, from the American Southwest, it kind of comes close to Mongolia. So you see this you know, human migration it just spreads on either side of the Pacific Ocean, um, almost um, identical to each other. So now, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bering Strait melts. My son just had a basketball game, and the mighty cyclones are terrible. <laughs> but we almost won, so you know I tried to project and lead us to victory. It just didn't quite happen. You did your part, right? I did. I did everything. I'm like, well, okay, we lost. Again. So anyway, our one game win streak is over. So, all right, yeah, we tried. So, 
Uh, over here in the Americas, the first civilization is going to settle between 5,000 and 2,500 BC. And if you put that on a world timeline, everybody else um, went from Paleolithic nomads to Neolithic farming villages around 10,000. So over in you know, Africa, Asia, and Europe, people are sitting down into villages, Neolithic, getting ready to start civilization 5,000 years before the Americas were doing it. The Americas will not settle in river valleys the exact same way as the Egyptians and Mesopotamia and India and China. They're just not going to do it until 1500 B.C. So you think about, okay, what's going on in 1500 B.C.? Well, the old kingdom of Egypt had come and gone. The pyramids are built. The cultures of ancient Mesopotamia, Persians, Babylonians, Assyri Assyrians, Phoenicians, Persians, They've all come and gone, and the big twin cities in India of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro have mysteriously disappeared. So everybody else has formed complex civilization, technology, public works projects, and Mesoamerica is just beginning to settle down in little huts in a fertile river valley. So it's here that American culture is going to begin, and they're going to remain untouched, unchallenged, for 3,000 years until 1500 A.D., nice book ends, 1500 B.C., 1500 A.D., when the um, Spanish get lost and show up. Good afternoon, everybody. So, um, the other thing that makes things really interesting and unique about Mesoamerica, and you can look at Machu Picchu over there, and I've got a Mayan pyramid around here somewhere I've got to get out. It's right straight back here on the old bulletin board is we think that this is Peru, but same thing went on in Mexico, I'll show you some pictures here in a second, is building these large structures, cutting the stone, quarrying the stone, building cities, building pyramids, and building temples. The people of the Americas did it all without the wheel. The simple concept of the wheel that originated in ancient China, they simply just didn't have. And the reason for that is, they didn't have any large beasts of burden, no oxen, no horses, no donkeys. Those things came over with the Spanish. So everything done in the Americas up until 1500 AD was done with this pure human muscle power. All right, good old on foot, hand labor, you know, you know, uh, bucket brigade, you name it. Everything was done the good old old fashioned way. So they also had no access to cultural diffusion. Everything they did. Again, they figured out for themselves. We know that China and India and, you know, the Silk Road linking all the way to Rome, religion, idea, culture, technology was spread back and forth in the Americas. Trial and error, and we will eventually figure it out. So, last week we talked about the kingdoms in West Africa and how Ghana was that bedrock foundation in Africa. Same thing's going to happen here in Mexico with the Olmecs. Here's my second horrible history joke of the night. How do you remember the Olmecs started in, o in Mexico? Because the Olmecs were from old Mexico. <laughs> Sorry. Put that one in an essay, Drew. You see the R.I. Right. So anyway, the Olmecs are the root culture. And if you think about Mexico as like an arm flexing, they settle right on the rim of, of, of the Gulf, on the Gulf Coast, is where they hang out. And they settle there because there's some nice fertile river valleys that lead right up to, to the coast. So there's good soil, they can farm it very easily, there's the cooling sea breeze, and they have access to the ocean. And the Olmecs are kind of interesting. Uh, they have a bunch of cities, like tiny little city-states, the two most important are San Lorenzo and La Venta, these big kind of urban structures. For the ancient world, they were sizable, around 30 to 40,000 people each, so think of like Chapel Hill without students. What's interesting is they didn't rise simultaneously. It was the same culture, but San Lorenzo is like the big 
capital at first, like where all the trade and business and everybody lived. And then slowly but surely, for reasons we don't know why, people kind of left San Lorenzo and moved to La Venta. So as San Lorenzo decreased in power, same civilization, La Venta rose. And I explain it in here, it's like people leaving Cleveland and Detroit and moving to like Atlanta. You know, when you have a big saying back in Cleveland is our main export is crippling depression. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know, there's, there's a train carrying jobs out of Cleveland. And everybody's leaving Cleveland and going to the new megapolis of Atlanta or Charlotte. So San Lorenzo declines and La Venta begins to rise. And the civilization kind of lasts, if you think in your mind, from the Trojan War, the Mycenaeans and the Trojans, all the way through up till like the end of the Greek-Persian War. So it's a fairly significant civilization in the classical age. And some of the things they do, pretty interesting. Again, nobody's bothering them, but they also don't get any help either. Uh, they make these elaborate drainage canals, and they line the canal that they dig out of the earth with limestone, so it, it's solid. And they get these giant pond-like reservoirs that they store water in, and they kind of do it in a circle. And they had an early lock system to kind of raise and lower the level of water, so the water wouldn't stagnate, they could have it flow in a circle from one reservoir to another, constantly keeping the water moving. They did it for drinking water and also for irrigating the crops if they didn't get a lot of rain. Just brilliant engineering in the ancient world. And because they're an early people, they say, huh, what is the coolest and strongest piece of architectural building to make? And they're like, Let's build a pyramid, all right? And so they do. And again, the big ones on the Giza Plain are already there, but they build a 110-foot-tall pyramid. People are like, 110 feet tall? And I'm like, yeah, what's wrong with that? It's only 110 feet tall. It's only a quarter of the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza. I'm like, yeah, but it's still like a 10, 11-story building. It's not as wide, but it's tall. And when you've got no animals to help you do it, it's a pretty difficult thing to do. And so um, the Olmecs are the first to demonstrate a pyramid that is used not so much as a tomb, but as a temple to their ancient gods. And the main god throughout Mesoamerica is going to be the sun. Whether you're Olmec, Mayan, Aztec, Incan, the sun is the big guy. So we have our first pyramid of the sun. And the villages are run by priest kings. You know, the smarter guys who could observe the signs of nature, they knew when it was time to harvest, they knew when it was time to plant. So they're urban dwellers. They live in the big city, and there's a very sharp social class division. The urban dwellers, the aristocrats, those in the know, normally the priest king and his family and close friends, live inside the city, and everybody else lived outside, outside the city <coughs> gates, and they did all of the farming. So it's like a Mesoamerican version of feudalism, all right? The Lord is up in his manor, hanging out, and all you dirty peasants go out there and like farm stuff. I'll tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and then I'm going to go and go kick back for a while, get a tan, you know, like do whatever it is that I do. And here in the Olmecs, they have a God that we see, it shows up all over the rest of Mesoamerica. Um, it is a half-human, half-jaguar-like God. So similar to the Egyptian Sphinx, but instead of a human lion, it's a human jaguar. And it shows up all over. And one of the things that is great about being on the seacoast and on these rivers we find Olmec artifacts a little bit deeper inland in Mexico, all the way up in what today would be Texas, and then down into like Belize and Guatemala over on the U below the Yucatan Peninsula. And so we don't know how or with whom, but there was obviously some sort of trade going on north and south across the coast of Mexico. 
And then right around 400, for reasons we can't explain, the Olmecs just kind of like crumble. And they're on the seacoast and power shifts inland. So if you think of going north and south in Mexico like layers, well, the outer layer of the coast was awesome, and it kind of dies out. And the next civilization in Mesoamerica is going to be a little inside known as the city-state of Monte Alba. And there's two standalone cultures here that don't get a lot of airtime because the Mayas and Aztecs are, are really cool. But they built off the Olmecs and on Monte Alban. And Monte Alban is a big city that is just interior about, you know, several hundred miles inside of Mexico, just outside of the Olmec territory. And Monte Alban will establish themselves, one of the things Mesoamerica is known for is capturing prisoners of war and offering them as a sacrifice. The first instance of human sacrifice we can see comes from Monte Alban. And they sacrificed people regularly, but when things were going bad, maybe it didn't rain, maybe there was a drought, maybe the crops weren't going, they kind of ramped it up a little bit. Well, if we, if we kill more, then things are going to be better. But they also do something kind of interesting. When things got really bad, the nobles would vie to sacrifice, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me, because they felt that since they were nobles, their blood was worth more and if they were sacrificed, it would appease the gods, and then they and their families would be heroes because of their sacrifice. I'd be in the back of that line. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm feeling kind of sick. I don't know if God really wants me today. So you want a champ, you go right on ahead. So anyway. Um, so they also have the first calendar that we will see in Mesoamerica, and it will also be spread to every other culture. It's a pretty neat um, system of interlocking circles. They had a large um, calendar for the sun, a solar calendar, and then inside of it they had a smaller lunar calendar. And so back in 2012 when people were freaking out, oh my god, the mind calendar stops and we're all going to die, and I'm like, people, they get it from Mont d'Alba and it's two interlocking rings. It's the infinity symbol, man. I guarantee tomorrow we're going to be I'm getting Jack Daniels and shotgun shows. And very <laughs> you can, but you know, you know, you're going to be all right. So anyway, all other Mesoamerican civilizations adapted or adopted and then adapted this calendar. And so Monte Alban will start around 500, and they'll go. It's a brief but powerful little reign till around the year 800. So right about the time that Ghana is becoming a major empire in Africa, and Charlemagne is the Holy Roman Emperor in Europe, Monte Alban kind of collapses, and we move interior right smack dab into the middle of Mexico in the powerful city-state of Teotihuacan. And it is built almost um, very close to the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. Um, but it is Teotihuacan that will really leave the blueprint and the imprint on Mexico as to how people build cities and run their empire. Um, they're very powerful from 100 to about 750. So think of the height of the great Roman Empire, Pax Romana, right to the heart of the Dark Ages. Charles Martel stops the Muslims in Tours or Tours. We're going to speak on it. It's T-O-U-R-S, the word is Taurus here in America. And I'm um, 732. So just after that is when Teotihuacan is going to collapse. And it's right near modern-day Mexico City. And just looking at Teotihuacan, you can tell that they had a strong central government. There was a central authority figure saying, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it, and I don't want anybody standing around. Let's all get busy. And the reason you can tell there was a strong central authority and a knowledge of complex mathematics is the city layout. City was laid out in a grid pattern. Every road running arrow straight, north, south, and east, and west. 
The main north, south, east, west road were a little bigger and a little broader than everything else, and they led right to the heart of the city. And in the heart of the city, you emptied out on a square, a giant plaza, that on one side had the governmental buildings, and on the other side had the religious buildings. And at opposite ends of the square, they had two giant temples. And so as you walk in, you see everything is mathematically precise. It must have taken someone very smart. And the thing about central authority is this is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. But to build these large cities, you've got to have your, lo your labor force organized. You've got to have your building materials coming constantly. You can't do something massive. If it's like a NCDOT worker, there's you know, the joke of one guy with a shovel and eight guys going, eh. Ken, great old baby, you just, you, you just keep on going. You don't have time. So you've got to have your labor organized, you've got to have your building materials organized, and everything fits perfectly. So you get to the religious and the governmental structures, and you do it by coming in from the south end of the city. If you ever get a chance to go down here, there's a little tour, do it in the evening, especially if it's like, you know, in the fall, I think, you know, Halloween here in America. Going into the city is this great public works project known as the Avenue of the Dead. And as you go into the city, on either side, like 10 to 15 feet high are these giant, like, masks, like gargoyle faces, these eerie, spooky faces, fangs, kind of like dragons and snakes. And what they are is they are supposed to to scare off the evil spirits from entering the city. They look so scary that evil spirits will turn and flee. And behind each mask or face is a dead noble or king. So it's the Egyptian version of the Valley of the Kings embedded into a wall. And the front of the wall are these scary, ooky, spooky faces for three miles. And so you kind of walk along if it's at night and... You know, it gets kind of, like during the day, you're like, oh, well, that's cool, but it's not really scary at night. You know, it gets a little spookier, but not much. But anyway, so we get there into the inside. At one end of the plaza is the Great Pyramid of the Sun, about 210 feet. So it's about half the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's made of stone, cut stone, but what makes it really cool is it's covered and all gold. Mm -hmm. right. People of Mexico had this heavy, kind of soft, shiny rock. It was like quartz here in, in North Carolina. Everywhere you look, you're kicking the dirty, ugly quartz. Well, they had so much of this stuff, they're like, well, it's really not worth anything, but we can melt it down and make it look really pretty. So they've got the 210 foot tall Pyramid of the Sun exactly opposite it, they have the smaller 110 foot pyramid of the moon covered in silver. Both of them, the four axes run perfectly north, south, and east and west. So everything leads to the center part of this great city. And where they're situated, they're perfectly situated to control trade going east and west across Mexico and a little bit north and south. So they become a big market town, and they will have about 150,000 people at this time. In the ancient world, that is an enormous city. Now, we know Rome topped out about a million, and there will be several cities in China that get close to a million, but nowhere else do you have 150,000 people. That's just a lot of, of people. So there's a big amount of trading going in, on, and around Teotihuacan. And you were good if you were a citizen. It's very Roman-esque. But if you were outside, maybe you were from Monte Alvin or somewhere else, if you were a foreigner, you could come in to Teotihuacan, but you were kind of segregated into a separate market. So if a Teotihuacan villager wanted to come in and buy wares from Trudy, she could, or he could, but Trudy could not come out of her um, segregated zone. Everyone was locked into this small little corner. So it's very sharp. Who do we want in the city to stay and who do we not? And they think of this was for defense. They didn't want outsiders to come in and get intelligence on what they were doing 
and why they were so powerful. And then they get a little bit too big for their bridges. And they're like, man, we've got 150,000 people. It's getting kind of compact in here. Let's increase the size of the city. And they do. And as they do that, have a good night, guys, they begin to displace their farmers. And the farmer's like, well, dude, what do you mean you're going to, like, eminent domain my land? Like, you know, we need to, like, farm. We need to grow your food. They're like, well, actually, we're going to build another neighborhood. We're going to call it Burgundy Villas or whatever is going on there about, like, oh, what's the name of that thing? Anybody know? Anybody knows? You know, my Colonel Burgundy sublined something. Bordeaux. Rose Island. I like yeah, okay, so anyway, it's some Claremont 12, I don't know what's going on up there. So anyway, uh, the people began getting, began getting rubbed out. And eventually, and here's how smart they were, they're like, wait a minute, this wasn't such a good idea. We're ruining our own food supply. So they halted the growth of Teotihuacan, and they take an idea that ancient Rome used to export their culture, they're going to go out 25, 30 miles and build a miniature of Teotihuacan here. We'll go northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. We'll build our little cities with Teotihuacan as the central hub. And they knew, they knew that if they kept going on, they, they would ruin their farmland. So it is Teotihuacan's imprint that we'll, we will see in the Mayan culture, later on in the Aztecs, because they're like, hey, this worked really, really, really well. So much like Rome leaves its ruins in Europe, um, Asia, and Africa, Teotihuacan does the same from central Mexico down to like Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, um, going on down to Central America. <clears throat> and it is the people of Teotihuacan who are extremely polytheistic. Um, the religion was at the heart and core of every single thing that they did. I mean, I slopped all over myself. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, anyway. Um, when things were really, really, really bad, just like in Monte Alban, it is the nobles that would draw their own blood. But instead of killing themselves, they would scrape like their hands or their arms and then drip and wave their blood all over their religious artifacts. So they didn't kill themselves, um, but every now and then they would, you know, you know, take a little slice, a little vein, drip their, you know, blood on it. Hopefully that would um, appease the gods. Who comes up with that idea? Absolutely no clue. But it was, it was all over. And then right around 700 they begin to decline. And we don't know why. We know there's records, you can see um, evidence of a big fire. But the city was rebuilt after the fire, but it was never able to recapture its former height. It never got back to as powerful as it was. And one of the big problems we have with studying Mesoamerica is the complete lack of written records. Some of the cultures, like the Incas, didn't write at all. Some of those that did, their records were just destroyed. You know, time, you know, just takes its toll. Natural disaster, volcano, earthquake, hurricane destroys it. Some of it was destroyed um, in interregional warfare. But the bulk of it was destroyed by the Spanish. When the Spanish conquistadors come, they see everything, and they're like, oh, man, that's really cool, but it's pagan. Let's just destroy it. So a lot of what people wrote, we simply just can't figure out, especially when it comes to the next group here, one of the big three of the Americas, the Mayas, the Incas, and the Aztecs. So there was that great movie. I love them. I wish they were true. Nicolas Cage's um, National Treasure movies. All right, He finds out that, oh, man, there could be this city of gold, and he breaks into Buckingham Palace, and he gets a board out of Queen Elizabeth's desk and holds it up to a traffic camera, because it's Mayan. And gee, who is the America's leading Mayan expert? It would be his mom, and she can read Mayan. Well, it sounds really cool, and it's awesome. The only problem is, we can't read Mayan. If we could, it would be awesome. So I'm like, oh, Nicolas Cage, great idea, but man, this just isn't working. 
So if you envision Mexico as that fist flexing, we're going to be on the Yucatan Peninsula down here, the fist. You know, the big, you know, Cozumel and all that stuff on the famous cruise lines is right here where it's this thick forested jungle. And this one is kind of hard to see. You see a little city here in, in the treetops. And it wasn't but like two, three years ago, if you remember this story, there was the Canadian high school student, like a 16-year-old girl, who was studying um, like satellite maps. He was trying to do an astronomy project. And by looking at Google Earth and the satellite and you know tapping into like, you know, like uh, old pictures from a National Geographic satellite, she claimed what she thought was a city in Mexico. I'm like, you're crazy. And she told her teacher. Teacher was like, whatever. But she kept at him. He contacted a friend like Queen's University who contacted some guy down the University of Mexico and said, well, give me the coordinates. And the guy and an archaeological team went out there, and I'll be daggone, but she found a brand new city that had been overgrown by the, the jungle. There had been a brief forest fire, and you could see a tiny section of these geometric shapes. And so they flew her down and, you know, let her, you know, check the place out. So there are still Mayan cities that we haven't found. You know, there's, there's jungle, there's kind of the drug cartel, so it's dangerous. But the stuff is still out there. There was an article today in National Geographic on that. Is there really? Yeah. Oh, all right. They're using these new kind of lasers. Cool. All right. See, guys, I don't make this stuff up. Very <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 You sound surprised that somebody validated this. I know. I really am. I'm like, oh. All right. People actually showed up. I got validated. I'm done. Who's going to have won that stinking basketball game? I'll get over it. It's okay. So anyway, call it cars. <laughs> so, um, a lot of neat stuff down here. We've got the city of Tikal. Polynesia, Chichen Itza, anybody been to one of those places? Sure, some of you guys have been. Okay, okay, here we go. Excellent. All right, so we're going to go from the Yucatan Peninsula all the way down into Central America. So if we look at this map, over here was like the Olmecs, and here was like Monte Alban, over here was Teotihuacan on these layers. Well, the mines are going to be down here in this greenish area. And there are 39 that we know of now, 40 different city-states that inhabited this region in the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. And everything is sort of the same. So when you think of the Mayans, think of the ancient Greek city-states. Separate little city-states that look roughly the same. All the same culture, all the same language, for whatever reason, they just like to fight each other all of the time. And these city-states were ruled by god kings, the equivalent of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh or like a priest king from ancient Mesopotamia. Their kings were living deities. And what is interesting, that all 39 cities, while they fought amongst each other all the time, they were all governed through the length of their civilization by single family dynasties. So the equivalent we'll talk about next week in Japan is the Yamato family, who is the only dynasty ever in Japanese history. Well, each city-state in the Mayas was governed by one family. Fought each other, tried to kill each other off, but the leadership stays the same the entire time. So their cities are big centers of trade and religion. And it's the Mayans who start to get a little bloodthirsty here. Um, while they hated each other at times, fighting over resources, they were linked by trade. And some of the things they traded are kind of interesting. Flint, you know, got to have that. Um, parrot feathers were used as currency, all right? <laughs> you know, red and yellow was, you know, um, kind of common, but blue and green, all right, that was like a 50 and a $100 dollar bill. That's like the good stuff. So poor parrots get like their feathers yanked out of them um, all the time. Cotton and jade. And what else they used, um, which is kind of funny, is they used cocoa beans. All right, so, you know, it's, why cocoa beans? I don't know, but they were a thing for um, currency back then. So anyway, these are the guys that will develop basic American crops 
that will spread throughout the world after colonization. Squash, beans, and corn. Good old maize. Crops that grow great in the climate and are very rich in protein, and you can prepare them in different ways so the texture and the flavor is different, very nutritious, and you don't get tired of eating the same thing day after day um, after day. And so here's another little look at the city-state of Tikal. And the pyramids are kind of stepped, um, very similar to the Mesopotamian ziggurats. And while they're tall, they're very tight and narrow, like, you know, vertical. I mean, you've got to be in good cardio shape to go on up there into the inside where the temple was. So 212 feet, I was only half the Great Pyramid of Giza, but it's nothing to um, laugh at. And so here we go at, at Polonique, you have a little different sort of pyramid, kind of shorter and squatter. And up here is where the big religious temple was. If you go in this door, you find this like six foot stone slab in this little um, arch. And it's very tight. Like if I would lay down on there, like I would, my shoulders would be rubbing either side. And the idea is you're going to have a sacrificial victim in here and you're going to strap them down. And then they're going to have, usually it's the throat or the um, femoral artery on the inner part of the thigh, and they would let their blood, this is kind of ghastly, sorry, you know, folks out there, kind of fill up these inscriptions to their different gods and kind of let it soak in. Then they would pick up the dead body and literally, like, roll it out the back. Um, and it was on a pivot, and they would then tilt the um, stone slab up, and as it, the blood kind of ran through here, it would drip down into the interior of the temple to different special artifacts for the gods and the goddesses because they really liked it. Again, who says, hey, I got one, let's get a special table and put it on a pivot, <laughs> you know, right? let it run around on the grooves and do some finger painting, I don't even know, all right? But uh, it's kind of ghastly, but hey, all right, so anyhow, um, we haven't seen anything yet, wait till we get to, to the Aztecs. And then the big one um, is the very popular tourist spot of Chichen Itza. And if you look at all three pyramids, kind of the shape, and the architecture and the, the texture are a little different. These are stepped, kind of rough, smaller, different little bricks. And then Chichen Itza is big, kind of like almost Egyptian style stone. And it's very smooth and it's very clean. So either it was different building material or they got much, much, much better at it as time went on. And Chichen Itza is like the big daddy of the um, Mayan little um, city-states to go and see. Also, <laughs> I'm joking here, <clears throat> um, it's the best example of another thing that is, that is evident in all Mesoamerican civilizations, the ball court, which was this bizarre little game. So you're down here in this part soccer, part football, part rugby field. And you played a game kicking a you know, goat bladder um, through these giant hoops up here that were tilted vertically. So it's like rugby meets soccer meets basketball. You couldn't use your hands to touch and move the ball, but you could use any other part of your body. And you had to get it through one of these small hoops way up about 20 feet on, on the walls. There were no rules. It was pretty much anything goes. You want to run some guy into the wall? Well, that's quite okay. On either side, you have these small, like, uh, VIP boxes. The high priest sat in one, and the king sat on the other side. And what's really cool is inside of them, they've got, like, satellite dishes carved out of stonework. So, we all remember when we took our kids over to the Durham Museum of Life and Science and upstairs in like the space exploration room, you get on one side and you whisper into the satellite and you can hear it on the other side. And so the high priest and the king could communicate. These games would go on for hours and you played until there was a winner. And there's a catch. 
kind of an interesting catch. You kind of had to know what you were playing for, all right? Because sometimes in the big festival, the winners of the ball game were super fortunate. They got to be sacrificed. And this was a good thing. Because in my mythology, there were two twins, the hero twins. And the gods of good, of justice and light, were fighting the evil gods of the underworld. So the hero twins let themselves be sacrificed so they could go down there and help out the good gods and goddesses. And they won! And so the gods elevated them. They made one brother the moon and the other one the star Venus. So you could always see them, and they were there keeping the evil forces at bay. So if you won the big tournament, if you won the World Cup, awesome, you get to be sacrificed. Most of the time when you played, the losing team was sacrificed because they were scrubbed. So you had to know, do I really want to try hard to win this one, or am I going to hold a little back today? I really don't know which way I'm going. But this ball game shows up all over um, Mesoamerica. It's one of those weird little things that they got into um, in their religion. And their religion it was all-encompassing. It affected and kind of controlled every aspect of their daily life, their social life, and their political life. It's almost like the um, you know, Mesoamerican version of the Islamic Sharia. All right? I'm just going to tell you everything you need to do, how to act, when to act, at, at all times. And much like ancient China, the Mayans had no separation between earth and heaven. Everything was on a single plane. So life and death, you were still rolling around here, which is why the hero twins um, got to be sacrificed. And unlike European cultures, the king was also the high priest. So the, a lot of these Mayan city-states were smaller like theocracies. The religion governed um, everything. People's daily lives, political life, you name it. And so um, the Mayans are going to be incredibly advanced. We'll talk about this in, in a second. Um, they are the first to come up with on their own. Again, they didn't get to go to the Middle East or over to India and learn about the zero. They're among the first to come up with the concept of the zero at almost the exact time the Arabs in the Middle East and the Indians are in, in India. So across the world, people are getting the same thing. And what really helps us with the Mayans is they developed a calendar. There's a lot about the Mayans we don't know, but the European conquistadors and the early missionaries had access to people who understood it, and they were able to line up events in European history with what was going on in the Mayan culture. It's called the long count. It happened at a fixed mythological starting point in the Mayan past and then went forward. So we could figure out fall of Rome happened here, birth of Muhammad and the spread of Islam here, Charlemagne here, the Crusades happened here because we understood how to use the Mayan calendar. Unfortunately, that's pretty much all we know about the Mayan calendar. Um, we use it, um, but some people still use it to this very day. And again, the Mayans, like the Greeks, had their city-states, and they lived in a state of either constant trading or fighting competition for um, natural resources, food, water, um, whatever. What's pretty neat about this is two of these 39 cities were actually governed by female queens. Um, very rarely in the ancient world, you know, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Hatshepsut, Theodora of the Byzantine Empire, do you have females actually being in charge, being the political and religious leader, but in two city-states in the Mayas, they were governed by women for several years, 15 years for one, and about 22 years in uh, the other. So um, an interesting thing that we don't see anywhere else. Um, social classes, a mere image of pretty much everywhere else in the world, our priest king on top, his um, 
You know, nobles and high councilmen, normally his family members, cousins, brothers, sisters. Um, then we've got the rich nobles. And these three groups lived separately from everybody else, high up um, in kind of the interior of the city. In the middle ground were artisans and merchants. And the market was held in their territory. And outside the big city wall is where the peasants would live. And all three groups would meet and mingle where the merchants and the artisans were, kind of the small middle class. So once again, it's the middle class bringing the upper down and the lower up in this common meeting ground, very similar to the ancient Greek city-states. So it's kind of like our neighborhoods, right? We may not know everybody in our neighborhood, but we know somebody who probably does. The city-states were small enough that they pretty much knew um, everybody. And so the Mayas thought that there were at least 365 different gods. Each day was its own godlike entity. And you could look at how the day went um, as how the god was feeling. So we know in the wintertime the god is getting angry and we're going to get you know, cold and snow and we're going to ruin lecture series. If there's a hurricane all right, or something bad, we know the gods are really angry, so we're really going to have to do something to placate them. We've got to find out what's going on and why. And so, not only are we going to sacrifice people with, with blood, um, people believe there was a blood debt. Like, you had to, to pay this. So along with human sacrifice, with, you know, bloodletting, um, you could pray, you could make different offerings, and outside are these giant limestone sinkholes, like this one near Chichen Itza, and you would throw food in there, corn, beans, maybe like one of your pigs or, or goats, maybe some gold or some jade or some cocoa beans, or when things are really bad, grab some people and chuck them in, all right? And they're um, vertical, so you can't get out. Um, we've sent little cameras and probes down in there, it's hard for humans to go down in. Several scuba divers have gone in, and the ground is littered with artifacts. But there are like underwater currents, you know, kind of like the flushing of a toilet that, that flow every now and then. And a couple of these scuba divers were pushed out of the central pit and sucked down into underneath the cliffs, and they drowned before they were able to be pulled out. So the Mexican government has made them off limits to divers. So you can put a camera down there. Um, you can do you know, archaeology that way. The humans can't go in there. This was in like the, like the 60s, so I mean, things may be better now, but it's not worth the risk. They don't send anybody um, down in there. So be good at math. You know, I always said, you know, I was so good at geometry, I didn't take it once. But my mom made me take it twice. All right. That's terrible. Great. Like, mom, it's to see. It's good enough. No, it's not. No, I promise you it is. Well, you're going to take the class again. I'm like, Mom, it's the same teachers. It's going to be the same result. Doesn't matter. You're going to do it. I'm like, whatever. If they would have explained to me, like, building things, that I would have got. But good old Mr. Um, what was his name? I don't even, Andre. Mr. Andre, he didn't explain it like that. Well, Mayans. They clearly didn't have Mr. Andre as their teacher, because they got geometry. And so everything is built on the famous golden mean or the golden ratio. And if you look at, if you apply that to other works of monumental architecture, from the Egyptian pyramids to the Athenian Acropolis, to the perspective, to the math that Leonardo da Vinci used to make the Mona Lisa and three-dimensional paintings, it's all based on the golden ratio. So the Mayans figured this out, again, all on their own, without help from cultural diffusion from the Byzantine Empire, from the Islamic empires, from India. They did it all on their own from scratch. And so if you look at Chichen Itza, the same thing is built with the golden ratio. And with that, their calendar year is almost identical to ours 365.2 days. So they added in a leap year every so often. 
And much like here in the United States, around the world, um, when they got to this area, um, the end of their calendar year, um, everybody, slaves, peasants, workers, got the whole week off. So they got a week-long New Year's instead of just trying to stay up to midnight when you're old and fat like me and going, uh, is Mariah Carey going to remember her song? Or is she not going to remember her song? And does anybody really care? So anyway, so all right. So anyway. Um, so here is the um, look at the Mayan solar calendar. I throw it up here. People don't get it anymore. But you see the Mayan calendar with a little face in the middle. It is the coin that whoever made the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, the Jack Sparrow movies, it's where they got the idea for this, you know, the golden doubloons that are possessed. But anyway, um, uh, solar calendar, uh, 365 days, a little bit longer, 18 month years. Um, each month has 20 days with five left over. And the lunar calendar is 13 months. Okay, we've been waiting. <laughs> now, guys, we can start. All right, Meredith is here. We don't know what's going on. We're like, okay, I'm running out of stories. Like, I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on anymore. So, anyway, so that's it for the Mayas, except for this little thing here. Um, again, about 18 years ago, hopefully validated in National Geographic, uh, there were some poor grave robbers who broke into a, a, a tomb and they didn't find any gold or or silver, but they found this little like chunk of stone that kind of broke apart in their hands. And some of it was um, like bones. And they took it to an antiquities dealer, try and make some quick cash. And the guy was like, well, yeah, let me hang on to it. Let me call a, a few experts. And lucky, luckily he was legit. He was a black market dealer. And he called a friend at the uh, Mexican Antiquities Department. The guy came down and was like, oh my God, do you know what this is? He's like, no, that's why I called you if I knew. I mean, can I, can I hawk this thing? The guy says, yes, it's invaluable. What it was, was about 15 to 20% of what is the Mayan Rosetta Stone. So, we only have a small sliver of what was going on. We've got supercomputers running around the clock trying to interpret or to you know, try and fill in the gaps, the other you know, 80, 85% of what we don't know. So these grave robbers stumbled onto this small part of the Rosetta Stone. Now, they got access and they searched all the other tombs in the area, hoping they would find the rest of the tablet and they haven't found it yet. So when Nicolas Cage has his mom interpret the Mayan writing, it just doesn't happen. We're just starting to figure out, but we know from what other, um, like, you know, the Aztecs told the Spanish that they've got a codex, a whole system of over 800 different symbols or glyphs. We just don't have them all, so we're working on it right now. So if anybody wants to be a linguist, um, archaeologists, young folks here in the audience, when you solve it, take all the full credit for it. Just in your press conference, say, I heard about this one day from the balding fat man in Chapel Don't even have to give my name. I'll be, I'll be happy um, you know, as all get out. What we do know, again, comes from the Spanish. And that's the problem with Mesoamerica is we learn most everything from the Spanish bias. Like, what did the Spanish think of, of what was going on? Man, i got to pick it up. It's 8 o'clock already. You guys doing okay? All right. All right. I'm starting to get loosened up finally. Here we go. All right. So, um, 8900, um, between the age of Charlemagne and the, you know, um, end of the early Middle Ages, um, getting into the great West African empires, the Mayas are going to collapse. Slowly but surely, the cities begin to decline in population. There's not as much trade. Was it ecological disaster? Was it famine? Was it some sort of plague? We simply don't know because we don't know what they wrote down. There's writing there. We just unfortunately can't read it. And this brings us to number two of the big three, um, the Aztecs. So 
Oh, we'll talk a little bit more about the mines. We just said that. Environmental catastrophe, we don't know what happened. But we do know when the Spanish showed up, the mines were all weak and sick, and they were very um, susceptible to the flu and the common cold, and very quickly they were um, wiped out. So, the Aztecs. Students always love the Aztecs, man. They really get into the Aztecs. And I'm like, God, the Aztecs are the most bloodthirsty people of just all time. <coughs> Um, they start out as small time like thugs. They were a warrior arm of another civilization known as the Toltecs. And when the Toltecs had a problem with somebody, they sent the Aztecs out there to world history joke of the day number three, kick some Aztec. All right, so, <laughs> all right, all right. Go home and say that. All right, so I'm saying. All right. Um, they were like the Luca Brazzi of the Toltecs. They went out and handled all the, the nasty business. Then they thought, you know what? If we're out here like breaking arms and thumbs and beating people up, why don't we just take over? I mean, why work for somebody else? And so they do. And they reach the high point of their civilization between 12 and 1400. Right as Europe is getting into the Renaissance, Right as we have the great Songhai Empire and the um, Kingdom of Zimbabwe, we talked about last week, is when the Aztecs are in power. Same exact time as the Incas. So we got the Incas, the Aztecs, Songhai, and the great Zimbabwe rocking and rolling at the same time going across the world. And the Aztecs are a perfect blend of ancient Rome in ancient Sparta. Right? They kind of have Sparta's militarism with Rome's conquest and extraction. They were Their entire civilization was set up as an armed military camp. They didn't have a standing army because every male was in the army. You didn't have a choice. Everybody is a soldier. The nobles, the high-ranking officers, would go to OCS. They would go to a special school to learn about leadership and strategy. The commoners went off to boot camp and they learned how to be frontline infantrymen. But what was interesting about the Aztec society, as militaristic as it was, it was the only Mesoamerican civilization where there was upward social mobility. So if you distinguish yourself on the battlefield, or with an artisan skill, um, you can move up in society and your family got to go with you. So everything is divided up into this militaristic camp. So, I'm going to take a small um, moment here, and one of the things that they traded with and used um, as weapons was obsidian, um, volcanic glass. And underneath Mexico City, it runs in different colors. The more vibrant, rich the color, the more expensive it was. So brown here would be used for like weapons and tools. It wasn't worth anything. Now, I don't want to freak you guys out. I'm not going to cut myself, I promise. I'm going to pass this around and gently rub, please gently rub your <laughs> finger on this edge. And so if I just take my pasty white Casper the Ghost arm and roll this across it, you can see very quickly it leaves a mark. So imagine being sliced like that. So they would make their weapons out of this small little pieces, and well, if you could, the line is still there. I cut myself. Wasn't it your class I cut myself in? <laughs> yeah. Got a little bit too real. Like, ah! yeah. All right. So it does leave a little well, a little red mark there. You can see it all growing in. So they would take these into like tomahawks or spear points, or they would get like large wooden paddles, and they would take a fine, you know, cut in the paddle and shove hundreds of these, like little wedges, into the paddle and then glue it with like sap from nearby trees. They would let it dry, and you had like this giant, like chainsaw paddle, and you would whip and cut and swing with it. And even if it broke, you still have those barbs in you. So nasty vicious weapons. It was also used as currency. Um, so this 